We have a special day, okay? We, that's our honor to have our DG give us the last lesson. Right now, I would like to invite our step in DG to interview the introduction of our retiring DG. to uh, be introducing a special seminar today. Before I do, I'd just like to welcome some guests uh, visiting Uri today, so from the Rural Broadcasters of the Department of Agriculture, a uh, big welcome, uh, and also a special welcome to our Global Rice Science Partnership writing teams from Africa Rice, SEAT, Jerkus, IRD, and uh, Sirad, sorry. Okay. So it is, of course, uh, Bob's second last day here at Uri uh, at Los Banos, and uh, it's a great honor to have Bob uh, give us uh, his reflections on 10 years uh, as a DG. For those who uh, are new to Uri, uh, may not be right across Bob's career. Uh, he was uh, a graduate of the University of Illinois, uh, of uh, Oregon State, and finally of Cornell. Bob's career uh, is punctuated by his commitment for research and development. So uh, he spent uh, time in uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, in, in Burundi, uh, in Colombia, and uh, also in Kansas. <laughs> of course, Bob spent uh, six years here as he had the irrigated rice program in the early 1990s uh, and since 2005 as DG. The last few months have brought a flurry of awards, so I'm going to read out uh, a few of the uh, prestigious awards that Bob has received which come from our partners uh, in recognition of the contributions and the standing that Bob has uh, in the field. So the most uh, prestigious award here in the Philippines, the Order of Sikatuna, the rank of Zatu, with gold distinction from the Philippines, which is the highest rank uh, a civilian can achieve in this country. I've also recently received a Doctor of Science from a very strong collaborator of various the ERISA University of Agriculture and Technology in Bhubaneswar. And uh, Bob was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences uh, in India as well. In a recent trip to Vietnam, uh, Bob received a medal recognizing his work for the cause of development of Vietnam from the Ministry and rural development. So, uh, a number of, of very significant and well known awards. So, congratulations, Bob. <laughs> I uh, often hear this end of year uh, talk from the DG described as a State of the Union address here <laughs> at Uri. And uh, I did a bit of reading about the State of the Union address in the US, and it's really actually only a relatively recent phenomenon. It used to be a report, a written report, that the President sent to the Congress, and everyone was supposed to read it. But along came radio and television, and the President thought, well, this is actually a pretty good opportunity to get a bit of publicity. Uh, and so it turned into what we know today, a grand piece of theatre, in which the President <laughs> can bypass the Congress and talk directly to the people, to politic for uh, whatever cause is uppermost in their mind. So, of course, the parallel here, here is that uh, you don't have to rely on, on DDGs to get the message, you don't have to rely on division heads or, or ONU heads, the DG can talk directly to the people. So 
gives you a chance for your last chance, but uh, a fantastic opportunity to have your wisdom and reflections on the last chance. So I'd like everyone to stand up because one of the traditions of the State of the Union is that you always start with a standing ovation. So, <laughs>
one of the leading newspapers in Southeast Asia puts on its editorial page a picture that the world, the fate of the world's rice and food security is on Erie's shoulders. I noticed the guy's wearing a tie there, but I've never seen him. <laughs> and that expectation was from the Green Revolution, the first Green Revolution, where we, through a series of, of innovations around a new rice plant type, a semi-dwarf, in a world where yields were a ton and a half a hectare, widespread famines around Asia were predicted. It, it was expected that in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, Asia would be facing wave after wave of famines and starvation, social upheaval. The future was sub-Saharan Africa. Well, not everybody bought into that scenario of the future, and theory was created. And it was basically an approach to say, OK, we can change the world by addressing head on the limitations of its primary food state, and that's rice. And basically, it was science doing what people said couldn't be done. And that's basically where we're coming from uh, at Erie. And these guys who were doing that work were real mavericks. The guy, the skinny guy on the dike there, Peter Jennings, was my mentor. He was the first plant breeder at Erie. He hired Gerd F. Kush. He created the gene bank. He curated the gene bank for seven years. He made the innovations that made the rice crossing possible. He and his colleagues came from around the world. I still stay in touch with Peter today. He's a crotchety old bird, but he taught me a lot. Tremendous amount. These people took risks. They came from all around the world, came to Erie to work, to transform the world, and there was absolutely no assurance they were going to succeed. They took risks. And I think. This slide says it all in many ways, that we should not shy away from risk. For those of you who can't quite see that picture, it's a little baby crossing the head of a, uh, of a Burmese python, I think. And research institutions are all about taking risks. If you don't take the risks, you will never succeed. But if you take risks, it's guaranteed that at certain times you'll fail. And you have to accept that failure. Some people say you have to be a successful research institution. You have to celebrate failure. I think celebration is a little bit much. But you certainly have to understand that failure will occur, and that you should learn from it. And I don't think it's possible to make really important progress without taking risks and without risking failure. But a failure to be a learning experience means that you have to have well-designed experiments. You have to know what kinds of questions you ask. So although we embrace failure, we accept that failure will be a part of our future, that doesn't mean that our work is sloppy. It means that we structure our work and then we look at it when it doesn't quite work out the way, the way it will, the way, the way it has. Now a key lesson that I've learned a number of times is that if you don't have a culture that accepts failure, you put the institute or any organization in extreme risk. Because people will then hide failure, they'll hide mistakes, they'll keep things away from you, and then you're in serious trouble. So don't be afraid of risk, don't be afraid of, fa afraid of failure, and don't be afraid of admitting when things didn't work out the way you hoped. Somewhat. Fantastic example. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But this was something that went on from 1978. Failure after failure. Things that went wrong. We didn't interpret things right. We, even when things looked good, we weren't sure if it was going to work. But ultimately, we'll talk to see later, it did. The new plant pipe heralded as a great revolution. Actually, didn't work out all that well. But was it a failure? Well, I don't think so. Because the architecture of the new plant 
fact, I had actually served as the framework for the Chinese nuclear hybrids and gave birth to the C4 rice program. The failure of the new plant type, how do you fill all those grains? Well, maybe we have to change the nature of photosynthesis in the rice plant. That's what I mean by learning from failure. You should be able to move forward well. But if you're going to take risks, if you're going to accept failure, if you're going to make claims about bringing hope and improving lives, you're going to have to be accountable. Did we do what we said we were going to do? And did we get what we say we said we were going to get? And that's an extremely important thing to keep in mind. We didn't take our strategic plan, well, some of us did maybe, and write it and then put it on the shelf and stop thinking about it. I have a copy on my desk. It's been there for the last 10 years. So are we bringing hope? Have we improved lives? Pretty important. So I'll avoid those questions and ask the obvious question, what is rice? <laughs> this is called classic deflection, okay? No, I, I want to remind us again what it, how important it is what we're doing, what the context of what improving lives is, and what is bringing hope. And it is, as we know, a fantastically diverse uh, crop. Our gene bank is just, it's a miracle every time you go and look at what's available. But I want to emphasize and keep emphasizing, and this is critically important that all of us understand, all of our donors understand, that rice is not simply a food, it's not a crop. It's the life being of half the world's population. People, if they suffer a shortage of rice, it's an existential challenge. And also, it grows where nothing else wants to grow. Asia, during half the year, the only crop you can grow is rice. It's the food, most important food to the world, most of the world's poor. It's the most important food, and I talk, I talk about important with a capital I, uppercase I, to half the world's population, and it grows under, for what for any other crop, are miserable conditions. So rice is here to stay. It's going to be important, and it's up to us to make sure that it continues to play a role in all that. And it's something that I want to remind you of, and, and I, I, I really was delighted to see this article that came out in May 2014 in the journal Science, because I've been talking about how important rice is, and, and, and it's in a, a valuable cultural uh, uh, center point for half the world's population. They did a study where they showed that the cultural differences between societies that depend on rice and those that depend on another major cereal are profound. The differences are profound. Rice communities, rice cultures tend to be collaborative. They tend to seek harmony. And the reason is that in order to grow a rice crop, you need irrigation, you need drainage, you need, you need teams to transplant, you need teams to harvest, etc. The whole rice culture that's developed over the last 10,000 years is unique in the world. And that's something else to keep in mind. And it's not just rice farmers, just rice growers who, who are like this. This is a cultural value that will, that will continue for generations, even as, as we urbanize. And I was struck by this picture on the international, cover of the International Herald, front page of the International Herald Tribune, a couple of years ago. This Chinese, rural Chinese family Yunnan, you know China, the great wealthy country, right? And there's an awful lot of poverty still there. And here they are, heating their tea over a fire. They've got one light bulb, and the other thing they have is a rice cooker. You get a little money, the first thing you do is you go out and buy a rice cooker. Which I thought was pretty important. So we look at rice consumption around the world, obviously, in Asia, most of the rice consumption, dramatically increasing rice consumption in Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa will become the, uh, it is, it's, it's the, the consumption of rice in Sub-Saharan Africa is faster than anywhere else in the world. 
Marco Wolf Rice likes to say we could double rice production in 10 years and we'll still be importing the same amount of rice. If we look at the concentration of poverty in rice growing areas, each of those dots stands for a quarter million people who are hungry. Or, I'm sorry, who are, who are uh, desperately poor, less than a dollar and a quarter of US a day. Anything you want to do about poverty, you're going to be looking at rice growing. And what is, when we talk about poverty, what do we mean? It's not just per capita income. And this is a picture I took when I was working up in Bangladesh in the, in the mid-90s, up in the Barin Tract in, in uh, northwest Bangladesh. I've told some of you the story, but I'll tell it again. We're driving along the road and, and, and looking out in the field and all these piles of dirt out in the field. I asked my colleague, I said, what are these piles of dirt? And he said, Let's go have a look. I think you're going to find this really kind of an interesting thing to do. So we stopped, got out, walked across the field, and looked. And those of you who can see in the middle, there's a little tube there. And what he explained to me was that the very poor people would go and find holes in the rice field where rats' nests were, and they would dig up the rat nest and steal the rice from the rats. To me, that was one of the most impressive demonstrations of what poverty means, that you're stealing from the rats. <laughs> now, in terms of bringing, bringing hope and improving lives, in that same area of Bangladesh today, farmers are far better off. And they are growing eerie rice varieties. As a matter of fact, in Bangladesh, when people talk about a new variety and improved technology, they call it eerie. So not only are there eerie rices in Bangladesh, there's very popular varieties of eerie potatoes, eerie uh, chickpeas, which I'm delighted to my friend at SIP, my International Potato Center, I said, I bet you didn't know there was an eerie potato growing in Bangladesh. <laughs> I, it's not exactly called bloating or rubbing it in, but uh, uh, I certainly enjoy doing it. And poverty, again, is not just numbers. What are the consequences of poverty? How do you hunger? This is from a feeding center here not far from Los Banos. Malnourished child with their young mother. Heartbreak. Our work on golden rice, I think, rice, high iron zinc, should go a long way towards making scenes like this increasingly rare. So the work we're doing is certainly, I think, in the right direction. There's no question about the need for it. And since I'm in the reflective mood, when I was putting this presentation together, I thought I'd just say where it all started for me. It started for me in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm that one. <laughs> the, the skinny one there, with the beard. I was, I was having lunch with my staff yesterday, and somebody who will go unnamed said, referred to me, and they said they saw a picture of me in, when I was at Seat. And they said, sir, you were almost skinny. <laughs> Which I thought was the most interesting way of saying you were still fat. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But in terms of bringing hope, improving lives, our program in Africa, Burundi is just, in Eastern Southern Africa, Burundi is just an incredible story. African yields, rice yields are terrible. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> They're terrible, very low, very poor technology that, that, that we know we can. And the country of Burundi, where Chris and I lived for three years, daughter was born there in a, in a mission hospital up in the country, went through a period of terrible civil war. And at the end of the civil war, the government came to a truce and they said, OK, everybody, you turn in your weapons, we'll give you money and a job. And so they did that. All the men who had the weapons turned their weapons in. They got money and a job. 
Unfortunately, in the rebel camps, there were also women. They didn't have a weapon of turf. And so they were left high and dry. They got no money, they got no jobs. They were really the poorest of the poor. Well, our folks there put together a program that started to teach these women how to grow rice seed. Because rice was becoming a very, very popular crop in Burundi. I was there working on maize. Subsequently, many, many, many of the rice of the maize fields have now been converted to rice fields. But they didn't have an opportunity to get good seed. Our people went in, trained those women how to grow seed so that the farmers who wanted to grow rice could get seed, these women then had a living. And they were sitting there high and dry. These ex-combatant women. And they were unbelievably grateful. Um, and these are the kinds of statements we got from them. Like we were only eating once a day. Now we're eating twice a day. Gratitude for being able to eat twice a day instead of once a day. They could buy a little soap to wash their clothes. Improving lives, bringing hope. Yeah, actually, exactly. And in a country like Burundi, and I'm enormously proud of the work our people have done in there. Not a large number of people, it's not the hundreds of millions you have in South Asia, but it's still people, and these are, these are important. If we look at the future and where we see things going, there have been a noises in the, in the years saying that, well, rice consumption is going to drop, et cetera. As, they, as countries become more wealthy, they're going to eat more meat, they're going to eat more, less rice, et cetera. And, you know, I drank that Kool-Aid, if you would. I, brought, I bought that argument. And, but if you look at the data, it just doesn't hold up. Per capita consumption of rice in Asia and worldwide is staying about the same level. So again, the message is rice is going to be around a while, and our job is going to be in demand for quite some time. We expect global demand, and per capita consumption remains the same, and population growth continues as it will. In fact, now the World Bank is talking about, or the U.S. is talking about, 11 billion people by the end of the century, not 9 billion. The demand for rice is going to be exceedingly large. So we're going to be needed, and we have got to be ahead of the game. But the trends are changing. It's a different world, a completely different world. When Erie was founded, look at this graph here, 1960, the blue is the rural population, the red is the urban. Everybody was living out in the countryside. They had these wonderful idyllic lives working in the rice paddies under the palm trees. In five years, over half Asia's population is going to be urban. And that is going to be the reality. But those people are still going to eat, and they're still going to want to eat rice. Our responsibility is to make sure they get that rice and get enough of it, and it's done produced in a way that's 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 him, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, comfortable for the environment. The way rice is marketed, the way rice is consumed—that's 1960s, 1970s, 80s, even into the 90s. But it's changing. People are demanding more diverse kinds of rice. Rice is grown in a way that is seen to be helpful for the environment. They want a different packaging, different kinds of rice for different times of year. The whole way rice is marketed is going to change. The, way, the demand for rice will be strong, but it will be a very different kind of demand in the future. We're going to have to address that. And where is it going to come from? Well, if we don't want to be cutting down rainforests, if we don't want to be destroying fragile wetlands. It's going to have to come from existing rice. Land. 